Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to episode eight of the Indo-Pacific series with My Security Media, My Security TV, and our partners, Aerospace and Defence Consultants Association of India. We look at aerospace, defence, and security technology and market trends, opportunities with India, Australia, and the ASEAN region. My name is Chris Covage. I'm the executive editor and director for My Security Media here in Sydney and my co-host, uh, Raman Sapori in Delhi. Raman, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. And very good to, to see you. And this particular episode, uh, we are still waiting on our, our two panellists uh, from different parts of the world, but they'll come on. So as per normal, we'll go through the introductions uh, to our episode. Um, as uh, anyone who's following us, we've got over 200 registrations for the series week to week. Uh, the main focus is aerospace and space, and uh, I will cover off briefly, but uh, happy World Space Week 2020, uh, and that is what we're going to be looking at today in our aerospace and space domain. We also look at defence and national security, cyber security and critical technology, cities and infrastructure, and the protocols are these sessions are recorded. They're live on YouTube, and if you have any questions of the panel or of, or of us, uh, please uh, uh, fill out the chat line there as part of the GoToWebinar platform. Mm. As I mentioned, we're just waiting on our panellists now. I think uh, Andrew, Andy Coronius, the CEO and Managing Director of SmartSat CRC, Cooperative Research Centre, he is in, based in Adelaide in Australia. He will be on uh, about quarter past uh, four or quarter past the hour. And likewise, we're also waiting on Andrew Boyer, Chief Executive Officer for Cleos Space uh, in Luxembourg. It's quite early in Luxembourg. I believe it'll be about 7 a.m. So we'll give Andrew uh, some time. Uh, and we've basically got the two Andys um, from different parts of the world. So this follows on episode four, we covered on space, where we had uh, uh, Subha Pavaluri from India, Malcolm Davis from Aspi in Canberra, uh, Yochi Kamiyama in Tokyo from the Japan Institute for Space and Security, and Glenn Tyndale, um, the CEO for Communication Systems at EOS. So that episode is available, and this is our second uh, episode covering off on the space domain. Uh, last week, we looked at robotics and autonomous systems, uh, and very much connected to the space domain, domain as well. Uh, that was a very good session with uh, uh, Stefan Rabar from Emerset and uh, Martin Keetels from Connect and Alta in Australia, and then also Andrew Yu from ST Engineering Electronics in Singapore. Um, and as I mentioned, this is World Space Week. So it's the United Nations General Assembly declared uh, Space Week from back in 1999. Uh, the, the Space Week commemorates two dates. Uh, one is the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957 and then the signing of the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies back in 1967. And I would suggest that the world is in some sort of space race at the moment, so it'd be interesting to see how that treaty uh, continues to formulate. We cover space on our DRASTIC channel, Drones and Robotics. Uh, DRASTIC stands for Drones, Robotics, Automated Systems, Technology, Intelligence, and Communications. Uh, there is a range of space-related content on there, uh, and CLEOS uh, obviously speech, uh, features uh, quite prominently as well, uh, just recently signing a distributor agreement um, here in Australia. Just some news from the week. Uh, literally today, the uh, quadrilateral dialogue is on with India, America, uh, Japan and Australia. So Pompeii is heading into Tokyo. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what sort of public statements are made from the, the Quad meeting. And some news from Rahman, the US uh, has approved 90 million Lockheed Martin's aircraft following follow-up support uh, to India. So obviously that is uh, strengthening the ties with Lockheed Martin in the in India. Uh, and thanks for this one, Rahman. Uh, you've now got the world's longest highway tunnel, 46 kilometres. Um, is this near you at all? You're in uh, Delhi? Uh, this is from a hill station called Manali to the region in Ladakh. It's a very strategically important tunnel in India and the world's longest highway tunnel. It's an engineering marvel and uh, an engineer's delight. And it was, uh, you know, dedicated to the nation just last week. 
in the memory of our late Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpai by Prime Minister Modi. You are welcome to visit India and never miss to drive through this tunnel. It's going to be a, a nice experience. And now this particular road would be all weather road, 24 by 7, 365. Earlier, before this tunnel was there, we had to close the highway for about four to six months due to heavy snow on the hills. Yeah, it's it's yeah. an important strategic thing. And then India is going to benefit. A lot of economic activity will take place because of this. Hilly people are very happy because now they can uh, get the, you know, food security, the industrial security. Also, a lot of investments is coming in in this region because this is very rich in uh, solar, uh, you know, uh, energy. This area itself. Thanks to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, not bad. Cutting four to five hours travel time, uh, which yep. is pretty significant. So um, yeah, well done, and uh, be interested to see how that goes. Forty-six kilometres. Um, the other one, India with uh, Tesla CEO um, suggests India entry into 2021 uh, as early as next year for the in uh, electric car market. Uh, and that's you there at Lowy Automobiles there. Is that correct? With an yes, electric tuk-tuk. Lowy Automobile is a company three hours drive from Delhi. I visited them uh, and they are now producing three wheelers, two wheelers and motorcycles fully electric. And all the and parts. How's the charging infrastructure around India? Absolutely. Now, this is going to be part of the smart city infrastructure. We're going to build up this. Uh, almost 40% cost of the whole vehicle is the battery. So is there yeah. anyone from Australia, anywhere else, who wants to be part of the supply chain to this particular engineering marvel? Most welcome. There are different versions of that. Next week, we'll put the brochure of this particular thing. So we are also having a practice in our association to convert auto to aerospace industry. Anyone who's having business downturn, we can ship them from auto to aerospace. This is going to be the next turning point in India and all over the world. Everyone is rushing towards the first electric vehicle. In fact, my own next vehicle would be electric. Of Thank course, I'm waiting on mine. Um, and uh, just briefly, I've got, I do know, a queen, I've just made a note, there is a Queensland company that builds the charging stations and uh, We'll reach out to them and see what they're doing in India. I know that they have been in the export market uh, as well. Um, so that's pretty much the news of the day. I didn't cover too much on the news. Just some key events that we're running, uh, sorry, that we're running, that we're um, supporting. One is with our partner, the ISAC Japan, in, uh, International Security Industry Council of Japan, and James there. Um, this is on tomorrow, and a challenge of change, Japan's defence policy in the new Suga administration. So one worth having a look at. Uh, that's uh, nine o'clock Tokyo local time. Uh, the other one is the ASEAN Summit, the IBM Security Virtual Summit for ASEAN region. Uh, that is available. If you go to our ASEAN channel, uh, you will be able to find that link through. So that is on demand content. And we recently interviewed in Singapore, the Global Resilience Federation CEO, Bill Nelson, and it's a very, very interesting uh, interview there with Jane Lowe, our Singapore correspondent, looking at the cyber threat intelligence landscape, particularly between the financial markets in the US and globally, uh, and how that trend is continuing to grow. So uh, again, the uh, GRF, Global Resilience Federation, is now basing itself in uh, Singapore as well. Uh, as we have been saying week to week, the top women in security Malaysia nominations are closing just a couple of weeks to go. Uh, and we are getting no uh, nominations coming in quite strongly. So that's one to support. And 3D printing world just a couple of months away as well in India, the 5th and 6th of December. Some other events, if you want to find out what's going on both locally and internationally in the industry, Welcome to go to the marketplace. So there's a range of new up events. Govware is also on this week uh, in Singapore. And then there's a, a number of other events next week uh, in Australia and the region. Uh, and some interesting reports coming up. A good uh, Closing Australia Skill Gap from Swinburne University was released the other day. And the Q2 Nexus Guard threat report uh, also came out today. So that's much from the marketplace. Um, just one second while we onboard our panel and just one so Andy is with us. We're just going to onboard you, Andy, just once. So Andy, thank you so much for your time. Very much welcome you. You're the 
CEO and Managing Director for the SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre in Adelaide. Uh, and happy Space Week to you. Thank you so much for your time. It is my pleasure and, um, and happy Space Week to everyone. Um, I think this is uh, the second day of it and uh, this is my second presentation. So I'm delighted to be with you and your listeners and to share with you some of the activities of the uh, SmartSat CRC. If we can no go to the for, next you, slide. Yeah, you just guide me through the slide deck. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, the SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre is an Australian government program that has been in existence for a very long time. That is, the program has been in existence for a very long time and we spend uh, uh, CRCs, Cooperative Research Centers, are meant to, to bring industry and academia together to solve some very large challenges of the country or to see some very large opportunities. And uh, it is something that allows us to actually bring industry and the research environment and specifically universities much closer together in uh, collaborative and applied R&D. Um, unfortunately for Australia, uh, we don't do very well in terms of uni university industry collaboration. We are indeed among the, the lowest of all the OECD countries in that area, yet we are pretty good in R&D. We are in the top 10 in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, research outputs, but not in terms of uh, monetizing those, adding value from those research outputs, and particularly through partnerships um, with uh, the Australian industry in general. So we felt uh, a consortium uh, of universities and industry felt that given the significant opportunity, the significant global opportunity in space, and particularly new space, the space 2.0, we wanted to actually bring the industry, small as it is, but growing, together with our universities, which have quite good capabilities in a number of areas uh, in space, to bring them together so that we can indeed provide some value and uh, that will allow us to really become a global player in, uh, in space. Uh, as you know, we were very lucky two years ago to, uh, or less than two years ago in Australia to have uh, a new space agency. And there is so much excitement now in the space industry for us to actually build a new high-tech country in this particular area. If we can go to the next uh, slide, please. So who are we? Um, the SmartSat CRC is a consortium of more than 100 organizations, uh, Australian and global organizations. We have um, 31 industry partners. Some of them are global players like Airbus and MDA and British Aerospace and others, Northrop Grumman from the US and others. Um, some of them are Australian SMEs. And of course, we have a very large number at the moment, around 66, I think it is, space startups that have joined the journey of actually building an industry through R&D. We were very lucky to raise $245 million in R&D over seven years. And with that, we hope to focus on a number of areas uh, in the space value chain where we feel Australia has significant capability and we want to augment and add to that capability through building our capability in Australia, but more importantly also uh, through collaboration with many other international players uh, like ESA and DLR and NASA and, uh, and, and colleagues from universities from around the world, from, from India, from Europe, from North America and so on. If we can go to the next slide, please. We have, um, we have decided to focus after having a very large number of workshops uh, here in Australia with our industry partners and universities, 
we, we have decided to focus in three large areas. One is advanced communications, connectivity, and particularly IoT technologies, particularly as they apply to space. Uh, and the second one is advanced satellite systems, systems that actually use AI tools on the platform itself, on the satellite itself. As you know, these days, because the miniaturization of computing has continued uh, to follow Moore's law, we are able now to pack very high computational powers on very tiny satellites. We're talking about 6U satellites could actually carry uh, payloads with one teraflop of computing power. That is, that is significant. That is enough to be able to, to actually not only just have advanced onboard processing, but actually to put machine learning algorithms and other AI tools on the platform itself so that the onboard, um, the satellites can become uh, autonomous, they can become cooperative, they can move in swarms, so you have swarm intelligence, and also become self-healing. Now, they are properties and capabilities that even the large bus size satellites uh, don't have or haven't un re until recently. And yet the smaller class of satellites is now able to take advantage of those as uh, mobile phones are able to be pretty much supercomputers in your palm compared to say 10, 20, 30 years ago. But it's not only the satellite itself to be intelligent, we also want to have intelligent payloads so that the processing of whatever they do, whether it is a communications function, whether it is an earth observation or remote sensing function, we want them to process the data as they capture it and in an intelligent way to send down information, to send down alerts, to send down actions and so on. That is what we want to achieve in program two, the advanced satellite systems, sensors and intelligence. And of course, the third program is all about next generation earth observation, about how can we do the next generation of remote sensing, both by building better remote sensors, whether they're optical, whether they are active remote sensing with ra radar, LIDAR and so on, but also how can we do better analytics of those and how can we provide information to the end users, information products that the end users can use. End users like agri uh, farmers in agriculture, miners in mines, defense personnel, they're not interested in data. They're interested in actions. They're interested in advice or what to do next. And in many cases, they're interested in actually having the system being automated so they don't even have to be part of the loop. They are the, the leapfrogging technologies that we are aspiring to do in this SmartSat CRC. And of course, as with all activity in a digital world, we want to make sure that everything is resilient and secure so that we are able to conduct communications with um, uh, assured security and assured resilience. If we can go to the next slide, please. And I'll come back on some of those, uh, Andy, in terms of AI and cyber security as well, but um, sure. keep going. So, so our, our kind of vision, if you like, together with our partners, not only within the CRC, but all of the collaborations that we are crafting now and the work that we do with um, uh, other large universities, research organizations, both here and overseas, and of course, under the direction and, and, and coordination of our space agency, the Australian Space Agency, we want to make a contribution to actually building the nation's space infrastructure. We have some satellites, of course, some communication satellites, uh, particularly Optus and NBN have satellites for communications and broadband, um, but we don't have a lot of earth observation capability. We want to actually improve on that. We want to really provide that 
for all sorts of different actions uh, and, and, and uses and applications. If you can go to the next slide, I'll give you just a, a taste of some of the things that we really want to do. Uh, we are taking a missions-based approach, and we are taking an approach together with many others, of course, here in Australia at the moment, in trying to solve, trying to contribute towards solutions of grand challenges for the country. And of course, water is a grand challenge for Australia because we are the driest continent on earth. We want to be able to actually manage our water, both the quantity of water that goes in and the quantity of water that leaves our water, our waterways and our water bodies in Australia, particularly fresh water, uh, but also how can we find cost effective and efficient ways to manage the quality of the water so that the fish don't die, so that we can have cleaner water for agriculture, for, and for many, many other applications. We are partnering with um, the CSIRO, uh, a very large research organization here in Australia, and we have the AquaWatch uh, Water Management Program. Uh, that is a program of projects, a collection of projects that will provide real-time uh, monitoring of our waterways. But also, as you know, uh, year after year, if one part of Australia is not burning down to a cinder, the other part is actually drowning with floods. Uh, every year we have that problem. We will not just use technology to solve this problem. Uh, you need many, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of contributions, but technology can play an important role in actually making our country more disaster resilient. And that is, that is the type of mission that we will play and the role that we will play, particularly around bushfires and floods in Australia through our disaster uh, resilience um, technologies program. And finally, of course, as all your listeners would know, Australia is one of the, a very large continent, a very large country, a very large continent. And indeed, if you cover the landmass of Australia, its territories, as well as the 200 uh, mile ex or kilometer exclusion, economic exclusion zone that Australia has with its seas and oceans, you are then accounting for one tenth of the planet. So in terms of protecting our borders, in terms of protecting our, our um, uh, sea resources, and very importantly, search and rescue responsibilities that we have, we want to be able to do that. Uh, and we, are, we will be working together with defense. Defense is a major stakeholder and contributor to the SmartSat CRC. And therefore, they also have some objectives that we will help them uh, meet those objectives. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the ARCO Watch, as I've mentioned, is very much a coordinated program providing 24-7, 365 days a year water monitoring through constellations of satellites, but also integrating the data with in situ data, in situ sensors. Uh, we have on many of our waterways sensors, water quality and quantity um, sensor measuring devices, but obviously that's not cost effective for the whole country. It's a very large country, and, and therefore it, it is just not cost effective. And equally, it does require maintenance because these things break down. Sometimes they are stolen and all sorts of hazards that they may have. But having those sensors and collecting the data via satellite rather than the terrestrial communication systems allows us to then have a validation of the water monitoring exercise throughout Australia. That is a program that we have now uh, developed a number of projects, three projects in particular, but there will be a lot more coming in the next two or three years, and we will be building uh, and launching a mission of satellites uh, progressively in the next uh, six to seven years. We can go to the next um, slide. We also want to ensure that we uh, connect Australia, provide ubiquitous, reliable, and secure 
communication and connectivity for Australia throughout. Uh, so we will be using some very advanced MIMO and cooperative communications technologies that are using are used in terrestrial systems. We want to use them in space. We want to. We already began with some projects around optical communications, uh, terahertz communications for intersatellite communications uh, technologies, uh, and and we want to be able to over time be able to provide communications throughout the country as a hybrid and com and 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 fully integrated system, not just terrestrial communication systems, not, not just satellite communication systems, but fully integrated and fully software defined, so that you are able to actually provide that connectivity and particularly provide connectivity through disasters as well. Because as we've seen time and again, uh, when you have a disaster, whether it's a flood or whether it's a bushfire, as, as we saw in the beginning of last year, the beginning of this year, in fact, the end of last year, catastrophic uh, uh, bushfires. And, and my colleagues at Optus, they were basically driving trucks to set up uh, ad hoc communication capabilities because a lot of the towers had gone down or the towers may not have gone down, but the grid went down and therefore there was no power for the mobile towers to operate. So all of those, actually some of those problems can be mitigated through having an integrated system that actually identifies problems and in an optimized manner, and in fact in an automated manner too, uh, can in fact reroute communications and provide uh, reliable communications all the time. If we can go to the next one, the next slide. We have just recently, only in the last uh, two months, approved a new pr uh, project that is uh, working with our universities here in Australia, as well as some industry partners and our defense uh, science and technology group, working with NASA to actually, uh, and, and NASA's search and rescue office at Goddard in, uh, in Maryland, um, to actually work together, collaborative, to get the next generation of search and rescue technologies uh, to upgrade the systems for maritime safety and so on, but to take a lot of that and actually also port it on land systems as well. So that's a very new uh, project and uh, it shows the extent of the uh, collaboration that we are very, very keen to uh, broker with Australian universities as an industry and also our colleagues the world over. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, some of the other initiatives, we, we are only one year old, one year and, and three months old. So, but nonetheless, we are very eager to make some progress and very eager to develop the industry here. Uh, and um, the first thing that we've done is we've established a new company of all of our startups. At the moment, there are 66 startups in what we call the Aurora, the SmartSat Aurora. And that is a space startup cluster that is supported by us uh, financially, but also with capability transfer. Our university helping the startup community. Sometimes it's practically one person at the kitchen table trying to establish a space company. Other times it's a handful of people in a garage and so on. But nonetheless, they, some of those, are really kicking some goals. In fact, uh, only recently Southern Launch, one of our startup um, uh, industry partners, uh, launched um, one of the um, rockets up to, I think it reached 88 kilometers, not quite in space. Uh, and that was the first commercial launch that one startup um, company here in Australia was able to do. And they do have very, very big dreams. Uh, another startup company that we have is Miriota, a company that came out of the uh, uh, spin out company from the University of so uh, South Australia with some very unique and very intelligent uh, uh, technology that allows you for $200 to be able to affix. Uh, a small box, a sensor, uh, to uh, your sensor to a box, 
and then four times a day at the moment that will increase uh, as they put more and more satellites uh, in space four times a day they are able to take that information uh, and and push it to a farmer's iPhone automatically and that may say where the where the livestock may is or how how high is the how empty is a water tank and all of all sorts of other applications like that and now Miriota has had uh, serious B funding I think 35 million dollars uh, only only about a month ago uh, they are going places as a global company in fact they've just established operations in the US and Canada so they they are the small tiny companies that we really want to help we've established a very a, an international AI for space research network to bring a lot of the capability around machine learning and AI from all over the world you don't have to be a SmartSat member to bring them together so that we can apply the, the very intelligent tools that they apply here on Earth, apply them on satellites as well. And we are doing a, a whole bunch of other things that I've shown on this slide uh, and, and a few more. If we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Annie. This roadmap is, is that publicly available? No, because in fact, I just came off, I had to leave the steering committee roadmap uh, uh, meeting early to come and uh, present okay. to you. This roadmap is actually being developed as part of the, the Australia's 2030 Space Industry Growth Roadmap that we initiated. Our chair of the board is chairing that, that, me, that steering group. And it, it comprises of the Space Agency, GA, BOM, the um, AGO, the Intelligence Services, uh, defense, many, many stakeholders in Australia who actually government departments and private and of course the space industry associations as well, both for space and for spatial, to bring them together so that we can develop a roadmap uh, and that roadmap would be published, I believe at the moment we're actually working on the, uh, on the, uh, time, the, um, the, uh, the timelines just before possibly around June, May, June of next year. And that, of right. course, will become available. And it will have recommendations for government to provide support in growing uh, industry. Yeah, I think a few industries need a roadmap like that. It looks like it's uh, nice and clear. And of course, we are very, very keen to partner with others. And we will provide a very generous uh, sc full scholarships as well as top-up scholarships so that we can build the workforce to build the capability in Australia together with partners overseas. Uh, and uh, we have promised 72 PhD completions to the federal government and around 400 space engineers, scientists and analytics uh, professionals. So we are very keen to ensure that uh, we build the pipeline, we build the capability, not just only for Australia, but for the world really. Wonderful. And I um, think the next slide. These PhDs is, are live, are they? Are they? They're live. They, they, you go to my website. There's the, the website link at the bottom, smartsatcrc.com. They are live. And uh, we are very, very keen to ensure that we get some uh, top class PhD students to start immediately. We have already uh, uh, brokered relationships with our industry partners and others so that. The PhD students actually spend time in industry. We don't want them to just become theoreticians. We want them to become the next generation of engineers and scientists for, uh, for space. Okay. And we believe very strongly in collaboration. We, we are committed to collaboration. We are committed to forming partnerships. And we have already formed quite a few partnerships ships but we really want to to uh to we we're kind of open to any collaboration that would make sense uh particularly around the roadmap that we have developed and we have a technology roadmap as well i think it is on our website uh, on the specific technologies that we will be working in the next seven years and i think that's it okay. if you go to the next slide yep. i'm pretty sure you <clears throat> thank you so much andy i don't have any questions from the panel, uh, sorry, from the audience, uh, if the audience has some, but I, we do have Andy Bauer 
also from Luxembourg, Cleos Space, uh, who is on with us. Um, so I'm going to welcome him shortly. Um, if there are any questions, you can feel free to uh, write them in to us. Um, but I think the main thing there for me in terms of the AI and cybersecurity within that ecosystem, Andy, how much are there pure cybersecurity companies in there? How much attention do you think is being given to that particular sort of domain within within a space uh, domain? Well, that is a very good question. And the answer, the very short answer is not, not enough. <laughs> there are not enough companies and not enough attention is being placed, particularly by the startups, the, the small builders who are, you know, for them being able to kind of launch and, and, and get the satellite up uh, is, is, is number one, very, very important. And resiliency of that satellite and security of that satellite unfortunately has been up to now a, a secondary order kind of problem. In fact, probably a tertiary order problem for many of them, or in, in yeah. some cases they haven't even thought of it. And that is a that is a shame and a problem. And that is why we want to change that attitude. And we have already established a, uh, a chair in cybersecurity and resiliency for space. And her role is to actually bring that community together and build that capability. Great. Guy Raman. Guy Raman wanted to ask a question or? First of all, thank you so much for such a powerful presentation. I wish very soon in the near future, we'll be doing a similar presentation from a space station. My question is, as a student of electronics and fiber optics, uh, more and more of electronics and silicon is getting into these smarter and smaller satellite technologies. And we have the laws of physics and uh, mathematics, which have limitations. Where do you think the mini miniaturization would end given the fact that we all have what is called the Moore's law? What is the next big thing going to happen? How small the small satellite would be? Just for case of thought. What are the challenges? Uh, it, in uh, that's, that's a big challenge, a big question. And thank you for asking it. Um, I'll have a, a go to share my, my individual thoughts about that. Clearly, um, I think a lot of people have already begun to realize that smaller is not best. I think that 1U satellites were great experiments for university students and high school students even, uh, and they do have some applications and you can go smaller, but, but really a lot of the activity, particularly when you are interested in to doing some operational, serious operational pro, uh, 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 kind of activities and applications, you really need to have a much larger satellite than one, two, or even three, three U satellite. Most of the work that we are looking to do would be probably in the class of 50 kg to about 150 to 200 kg. But in terms of Moore's law, uh, yes, of course, miniaturization even now are reaching the limit in terms of going down to atomic levels. Um, and therefore, there, there will eventually be a limit. Usually what happens though is, it, is a switch of paradigm. You may be using silicon today, tomorrow you might use something else. You might use quantum, for instance. In fact, quantum computing and quantum communications is an area that the smarts at CRC will be focusing along with his partners. So, so yes, the limit, the limit is uh, being reached very quickly when it comes to silicon, but then you just shift into another paradigm and another method like quantum computing or biological systems even. Uh, what is your advice to the companies who are invested and in, still investing in the nano satellite technologies? Is there a market for nano satellites? Um, I'm not sure whether I, uh, I'm really qualified to know where the, where the market will go in this area. I <laughs> think from what I understand, uh, yes, nanosatellites at the moment, particularly for experimental purposes, particularly for proof of concept and so on, they are very useful. So there will be a market for launching those satellites in the next five or even longer years. But really, most of the serious applications would have to be done with larger satellites rather than just the uh, 
the you know the nano satellites and the six U's or even 12 U's. But but nonetheless, there are some applications even now where they are used, uh, and they are used for Earth applications. But actually, in the future, they could also be used for out of space applications for the Moon and Mars program and so on. Thank you. Sir. Very interesting. Look, I think um, and we've had Andy Bauer uh, waiting patiently. Uh, also, Andy, uh, thank you so much uh, for your patience. Just check your audio with us too. Hi. Wonderful. I was worried that you were using a Mac as well. Uh, <laughs> Here's Professor one. Yes. Good on you, um, Andy. Just a long piece. You two don't happen to know each other, do you? Uh, no, but I, we've got a good I, I pleasure now. <laughs> okay. Look, uh, Professor Coronius, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome to stay on if there's other questions. Um, Andy, uh, and I've got the two Andys here. I'm going to call uh, Andy Bauer. I'm going to call you Andrew. Um, so, Andy, you're welcome to, to stay on uh, during Andrew's uh, presentation. Um, but Andrew, you've got a slide deck ready to go. If I can do a screen set with you, or do you want me to bring that deck up? That you yeah, you can bring that. Uh, you can bring that PDF deck up if you. Um, Just one uh, second while I bring that up on the screen. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for uh, having me. Uh, Cleos is a um, space-powered RF reconnaissance company, so we're um, delivering a. New or, or certainly uh, nascent data set into the Earth observation uh, sphere, really to complement um, other Earth observation technologies like AIS, um, imagery, etc. So we're using multiple satellites to geolocate the position of transmitters. So what might have been called in certain spheres as signals intelligence, um, signal processing, etc. There's um, there's a few different ways of if you keep going a bit further down, it's Control L if you want full screen. Control L, thank you. That will do. <laughs> no, hang on. Wonderful. Good work. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're, we're providing uh, our data set from our satellites um, into the ISR domain. So the intelligence service reconnaissance domain, predominantly into defense and security sectors. Uh, we are sort of staying one layer above the application uh, aspect. So we work generally with um, integration partners, with analysts that are providing the intelligence. There's a fantastic community already existing in a, uh, an analytical sense from a, um, you know, developing AI methods of, of analyzing big data sets, particularly in ISR, to deliver solutions, to find out what's really going on there. Um, those guys are doing the layering. We're generally sitting in fairly early on in the process as a sort of tip and cue type exercise. So very, very simply, overly simply put, um, where we're finding the presence of, let's say, push to talk radio. Uh, you compare that against AIS. There's an absence of AIS. That's interesting then from uh, a maritime perspective to bring up, say, an imagery, uh, an image, whether it's optical or synthetic capture radar, so that you can see what is really happening. So we're part of that picture. We're part of the, um, we're part of the, the, the sort of jigsaw puzzle to work out what's going on around people's borders, around sort of maritime environments that are under threat, um, whether it's from a defense or a regulatory or security perspective. So you know, we use this terms of shining a light on this dark maritime uh, activity. Do you want to jump over to the video? Uh, uh, I will do. Now, just before we do, you're an Australian listed company on the Australian Stock Exchange. Correct? Yeah, so, yeah. so, yeah, so the, the, the company is, um, uh, it's a it's a startup. We've been around um, since 2017, um, started in Luxembourg. Based, uh, most of the team is based here in Luxembourg. We've got a small team in the UK and a small, uh, albeit growing team in the US. Um, but most of the team here is, 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 is based in Luxembourg. Luxembourg company, we're actually listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, um, which is how we kind of raised, if you like, our Series A financing um, to procure the first uh, batch of satellites, get those launched and, and what have you. We've had some challenges to getting things launched, perhaps beyond the normal space challenges. Um, I think it was, uh, we, we were expecting some delay, but COVID certainly threw in an additional layer of delay, which has been um, 
uh, a challenge to, to get over, but you know we're, we're, we're getting there now, and I can take you through the take you through the story. Great. Let me uh, get this going. One second. Thanks so much. Sort of introduction as we as we're watching the video. So satellites are flying in places four, each equipped with radios for collecting radio transmissions at each of the points, downloading the information to the ground where the information is then processed using algorithms. Um, we're finding the artifacts within the noise store essentially um, to look for radio transmissions. We're using a technique called multilateration to geolocate where those, those radios are. So that's uh, just a very simple, it's kind of a useful visualization uh, to, to start us off with what, we, what we're doing. So you can just go back to the slide deck now, Chris, thank you. Good work. Thank you, sir. Okay, so this is basically what we're looking at there. We, we have these uh, four satellites. The, the video wasn't to scale, evidently. The satellites are about 100 kilometers apart from each other. Um, but what that does is it gives us quite a good ground coverage with regard to the ability to, to um, collect different radio transmissions. Predominantly, what we're focusing on in our scouting mission is push to talk radios, as you, you've seen in the sort of cartoon graphic here. The important thing is there's not a lot happening in space. The satellites themselves are sensors, they're you know, remote sensors. Um, we're not doing much processing. There's, uh, we're not wanting to get rid of any of the signal. We want to be able to really collect as much as we can and downlink as much as we can of the, essentially the raw transmission so that our geolocation algorithms and our signal processing engineers can do the best job that they can do on, on those uh, transmissions. So we get the information back to the ground station, processes through our algorithms, um, and depending on which iteration we're using of the algorithms, we, we clean it up various different times um, in order to find sort of a refined data set, which is essentially the data as points on a map, where we're seeing signals, the time we're seeing them, um, the, the approximation of the power of those transmitters just gives them uh, the ability to have another layer in their, their geospatial intelligence data sets. That is, in essence, what we're doing. So as we grow as a company, uh, clearly one cluster of four satellites isn't um, a complete solution to all, all, all problems. We need to fly a constellation, aiming to fly up to 20 clusters of four satellites, so 80 satellites altogether. That gives us pretty good revisit time of most uh, key areas of interest um, at that stage. Also aiming to broaden things out by adding different payloads. So at the moment we're focused on these push to talk radios. We see this is quite an interesting area to look at. Um, they have the ability to identify the location of activity. That activity is usually coordinated using push to talk radios, whether it's illegal transshipping or illegal fishing, etc. So if you drop onto the next slide, I think we move on to an okay. application. So if I down button, here we go, hang on. How's that? Nice. No, that, that, perfect. Well done. <laughs> so this is just covering off some of the challenges. As I said, well, our business model approach is really not to develop the applications ourselves. We are working with application developers, so partners which are generally um, usually quite large prime contractors. Um, we have some, some very large entities around the world that we're working with. In Australia, our, our partner there is a company called SciSec, hugely uh, experienced and, and um, very well respected defense company in, in Australia. And they are uh, our channel partner, our ability to bring in different data sets and deliver more of a solution to the customer. So at this point, the company is a data company. We are a remote sensing company. We're flying sensors and delivering data sets. But this is the sort of marketplaces that we're, we're targeting through those uh, routes to market, whether it's regulatory, commercial, or, or defense. 
So commercial would be more of your traditional maritime uh, players looking for threats, etc. Regulatory could be illegal fishing um, uh, aspects, but also could be use of the radio spectrum. We're clearly mapping the use of the radio spectrum. What's, how is it being used? Where is it being used? And the amount of usage there. That's interesting to, to customers as well. So we are um, looking for how we can uh, deliver more value out of things like Earth observation uh, data sets, like, um, like take for instance synthetic actual radar imagery. It is, uh, SAR imagery is fantastic. It looks through clouds, um, it can deliver a very, very accurate picture of what's going on, but knowing where to look uh, is, is often a difficult thing. Where to trigger your satellite to take an image is, is a difficult thing. So what we're really doing is trying to look at how we can use those assets more effectively, uh, more efficiently through a sort of tipping and queuing type exercise. So you mentioned was that tipping and queuing? Yeah, so tipping and queuing is um, uh, one of these sort of I industry terms, if you like, uh, from a defense sector perspective, where you are um, queuing other assets. So say, for instance, we yeah. have, uh, we found something um, that we think is interesting, but we aren't able to judge what that is. The best really route there is for a maritime patrol aircraft to go and take an image of it, investigate it and see what see what's happening there. Um, it's much more efficient if you can send an MPA to a, you know, a one kilometer block uh, yep. in the ocean rather than it flying and doing up and down, you know, the, the, the coast type normal routine measures. It, you're reducing the cost uh, of flying the MPA. So tipping and queuing is a, is a useful way of improving the efficiency of assets that already exist, whether they are exquisite space assets or um, air breathing. Uh, ISR assets like uh, an APA. So your your clusters will be you'll be able to move them around or bring them in. Uh, are they movable? They are movable. Yeah. So we we do yeah. carry propulsion. It's limited how much we can right. move them. Okay. So um, most of the, um, the the reason why we have propulsion on both satellites is really well, to test out different formations of those clusters of four so that we can optimize our geolocation accuracy. Um, but also to do some collision avoidance. Um, and then finally, because we're a, a, um, a responsible space actor, is to actively deorbit the satellites at the end of their useful life. Um, and then so they demise through the, through, the, uh, through the atmosphere, but we'll do that actively because we're fairly close to the International Space Station. We'll get past the ISS and then you know, they, they come back down to Earth with natural Not track. Right. So, so that's, that's the reason why we're propulsion. The, the way you get cover is by having more satellites. It's sort of the business model of the nanosat, if you like, where you can't fly around the skies with, with ultimate freedom. You need a lot of delta V to, to, um, uh, to change orbit, or to, certainly to change inclination. Um, so we would tend to just fly more satellites. It's much more cost effective to do that. Right. Okay. So this is our first mission, the scouting mission, the uh, it, it somewhat infamously delayed uh, mission. Uh, it was due to launch the end of 2019. Um, satellites been ready for some time. Um, got pushed back to um, uh, March 2020, so it's early on this year. So we're launching from um, India on on a PSLV. So we had this sort of normal launch delays. Uh, obviously. Um, uh, at about that period of time, when we were just integrating the satellites into the launch vehicle, the world shut down, and uh, it's taking some time to sort of get back in and running. Um, thankfully, India is um, sort of getting a grip on how to uh, manage both the economy and also public health, and is back to work and starting on the, the launch campaign again. So we are due to launch the, in the first two weeks in November now. So that's, that's uh, fan fantastic news that we've sort of got over this six months of essentially pretty dead time. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's great. Those are satellites are in what's called a 37 degree inclined orbit. So if you look on the left hand mm -hmm. side there, um, they are uh, within the yellow and red band. Um, they do not see the high north, they don't see the, the, the far south. So we see you down to about as far as um, Melbourne in Australia, um, about as far north as 
Lisbon in Portugal. I can't remember the Asian equivalent, but it's it's about that far, far north is what we see. What's, that, what's great about that is we see the main areas of interest around the equatorial region many times, more than you would in a sun synchronous orbit, which is a sort of more traditional Leo orbit that you go into. Um, so it means that we get to see, you know, our challenge areas like the Straits of Mars, which is the bottom left there, where you see the formation and, and the swap of the satellites. So Straits of Mars, South China Sea, um, are clearly around the, the north coast of Australia, where there's a lot of challenges to Torres Strait, et cetera, um, which we're working with various different customers on solutions there. Also, a lot of problems where there's a, uh, you know, significant issues around the west coast of Africa around illegal fishing. Um, there's a, a, a very big environmental challenge there. Um, drug smuggling coming from South America over to the west coast of Africa as well is something we're targeting there, essentially the shipping routes of the bad guys. Um, and we've there, got good... Andy, sorry, there is a question. Someone has said, how are you picking up sort of the illegal fishing and, and drug trafficking? I take it that's through their radio communications or... Um, exactly. Yeah. Or observations, actual imagery. It, it's it's so what we're doing is we're um, we're not making any judgment. These you know the radio transmissions could be perfectly legitimate. Um, all we are really doing is saying there is an existence of push to talk radio activity. There is an absence of AIS, so there's not a legitimate ship in that particular area. Um, so we're not expecting to see activity, but we are seeing radio activity. Radios okay. are used all the time. In the maritime environment because they're safe for them to use because you know they, they can only be detected sort of line of sight from a terrestrial perspective so a few kilometers out a couple of miles um, depending on how high the mast is maybe a bit further than that um, but those transmissions do go to space so they can't hide from the space uh, antennas if you like so we're able to uh, detect that presence of activity and all we're really doing is saying there is some activity here which isn't portraying a legitimate signal from an AIS perspective. Can you can you identify the, the radio device through the signal? Does it have a signature? We're, uh, it, it has a uh, signal fingerprint, yeah. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of experimentation on the signal processing, the signals intelligence aspect. Um, so early days, we are um, really just working on locating the presence of a transmission, um, but this is what I was sort of referring to earlier with regard, we're not throwing any of that signal away. So that's then interesting as we evolve more of our signals intelligence capability, the ability to find more information in that same signal, we can pull more and more and more data out of that. Nice. Starting to attach uh, signal fingerprints to perhaps an AIS transmission. So if AIS is turned off, we know what the ship is or who the ship is, or have at least an idea. Um, and there's some really interesting things you can get into once you start getting down that road. Um, I'm not suggesting it's, we're in that position today. We're, we're certainly not because yeah. we're concentrating on uh, the, the sort of minimum viable product, if I can put it sort of somewhat crudely, which is geolocation, detecting the, the signals, making sure that we're getting good, reliable geolocation over and over again. But we have a whole lot of information in that noise floor that we can start to pull out and analyze as we grow as a company, et cetera. Uh, is it um, is it targeting like is it sucking it up? Like any radio transmission will get detected. It's not uh, yeah, something within a quite a small band. Um, yeah. So we are, for, for instance, with the, the scouting satellites, it's relatively refined. So we're picking up all maritime radio channels um, in in the VHS spectrum. So um, you know, there's there's eighty odd channels. We're picking up all of those channels. So if they decide to go off a normal channel and much further up the spectrum, or they're using uh, UHF, et cetera, then no, we, we can't see that. So um, the, the reason for that is partly practicality purposes, uh, you know, collecting a, a radio noise floor is a phenomenal amount of data. It's even, even exceeds that of an imagery satellite or a SAR satellite. Um, so we, we have to be we have to manage that data flow, otherwise we won't be able to downlink it practically yeah. from a small satellite, even with the uh, most advanced techniques that we're using to date. So um, there are then some further uh, things that we're doing to increase our, uh, our collect capability, which is um, improving our compression uh, on board the satellites. So using lossless compression to try and 
there's some really clever guys working in that area uh, around the world at the moment. So we're sort of leveraging some of the work they're doing in other areas to, to apply to our uh, particular technique to collect, collect as much as we can. Right. And sorry for my ignorance, you're, you mentioned the, um, the band around the equator. What's limiting your orbit? Is it uh, regulation or the actual no, orbit that you're on? What we get put into from the from the uh, from the launch vehicle. So okay. we're, we're put into that 37 to clean, 37 degree inclined orbit, um, and it's very very well. It's possible, but it's very difficult to change your inclination um, because you're you're on a set course, really, from a, from a Leo perspective. Um, so we can change height relatively simply so we can maintain our orbit um, but actually moving out of that particular inclination is is you would need a huge amount of delta v to do that or a huge amount of fuel got it okay um so really i uh, just in terms of the example there i really wanted to just give a kind of you know, very rough flavor with regard to the amount of sort of data i think it's partly important from a, a context perspective i think people uh, sometimes think with with, uh, with satellites you have a kind of consistent coverage. Sorry, I've got an echo. Sorry, I've got an echo. Is that your end, Andy? I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, it's gone now. Yeah, it's um, okay. Um, yeah, it's, I think people think from a safe space perspective, you have this persistent coverage. The satellites are always over an, an area, and it obviously doesn't work like that with, with LEO satellites. You're flying around the Earth you know, many times a day, and so you're really only seeing a particular area of interest for a certain period of time. Just to give you a bit of a flavor for, for, for what that is, um, in if we're looking at the South China Sea, which is of interest to lots of uh, particular customers at the moment, we pick up around 70 hours a month of activity over that with one cluster of satellites. I was going so to say, you, uh, you need to build up more clusters to have a more persistent coverage over a yeah. particular area of interest. I just does, thought, your, you know, does your 20 hit that mark of near full time? Like, what's your, because you're at two clusters or coming up to two clusters now. Yeah, so Quite so a way to go. It is down to around between 10 and 20 minutes revisit times over, depending on where we are on the earth and, and the various different factors. But it's a good near near real time coverage from a from a practical perspective. I think particularly when you're in the maritime environment, ships aren't moving very quickly. So you yeah. do you do have that benefit there in, in terms of uh, in terms of things not moving around hugely rapidly, and you've probably got a good good period of time there. However, you want to be able to capture all transmissions and see, you know, if somebody happens to be not speaking when you're passing over, and then obviously communicating when you're then uh, on the other side of the earth, then you're not you're not seeing that communication. So we have to be able to to create some some form of persistent coverage. And also opening up different applications outside of maritime because we're obviously we're collecting data over land as well and there are certainly land applications for the defense and security sector right and so you just drop onto the next slide yeah so our sec second mission uh we have the, the satellite in, in build currently for this um for this mission which is launching in um uh, june spacex into a um SSO orbit, so sun synchronous orbit. So that means they're going over the poles essentially. Um, and so we see the sort of vertical parts of the, the Earth with much more efficiency. So really since we've had the, the scouting mission, we have got lots of customers engaged and, and signed up. It's a really interesting one, particularly you know, places like Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, that just simply aren't very well covered by the, the scouting mission. So we're using the uh, second satellites to fill in some of those gaps around uh, the, the, the scouting mission um, uh, orbit, which is the red line, and obviously the SSO line is the, um, is the uh, second cluster mission. Which we're calling polar vigilance because it's focusing more on the on the poles more than anything. This is um, a, this is uh, launching in India as well, isn't it? No, this is SpaceX. So launching out of the US. Of the US, got it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
Um, so this is interesting, complementary, uh, very complementary to the first satellite. And then we'll start to, you know, as we're launching out our constellation, we use different orbits to fill in different parts of uh, our coverage until you have a, a good coverage of the globe with as most efficient revisit times as you can. All right, do you want to how, how does, Sorry to ask so many questions. It's a fascinating yeah, area. But so your first mission you're launching next, uh, well, yeah, next month. Uh, yeah partner with India and then you're moving to SpaceX. How how does that work in terms of is it like catching a flight of, okay, there's a launch next year, they can't you sell they sell that space. Is that how commercial it is now? And you kind of yeah. jump on to whatever flight you've got? Yeah, exactly that. Um, so we, we are at our level or our size, so our, our total launch is of less than 50 kilos. Um, so we are uh, what they call a ride share mission. Um, so we bolt onto the side of a main uh, satellite. So the PSLV is launching a, a radar satellite called 2BR2 um, for the Indian government, which is quite a big satellite, probably half a ton uh, size satellite. And we're bolting around and they share, they, they have a variety of different customers that are bolting on around the outside of that. SpaceX are doing some similar in terms of their ride share missions. Um, so really when you're trying to decide where to go, um, who you're launching with, there's in reality very little choice. Um, but, uh, and it's certainly not quite a bus service where you can turn up next month and go. You're still needing to plan at least 12 months really ahead uh, right. uh, of, of where you can get to make sure you've got a slot booked in. And I think that's going to be probably the most interesting part of the space industry in the next 24, 12 to 24 months is uh, there's a lot more launch capacity coming online. Um, the uh, SpaceX uh, uh, rideshare capability is relatively new still, um, and they are opening up a, a large part of the market there. Uh, traditionally, in our size of, uh, of sector, it was PSLV, it was out of India, that was the launch provider in, in, in essence. Uh, perhaps Soyuz as well. The um, ESA Vega uh, launcher is, is becoming more prevalent. It's probably still only three times a year though. Um, obviously Rocket Lab out in New Zealand, which is focused very much on small satellites, but is expensive. Um, so, so not a choice for everybody, yep. some folks, but there's a lot more launches coming on, on board. Um, Australia should have uh, their own, I think 2024 potentially, um, and the Coronas, uh, if you're still there, if you've got any insights on uh, where we're going in Australia, but I understand um, both South Australia and potentially Queensland sites uh, could be used. Um, okay, yeah, we're, we're tracking these guys uh, very closely. Um, you know, it's important to know what's coming along, particularly as you're sort of, you know, rolling your constellation out. We need to be very mm. clear on that. I think the Australian sites are, are um, uh, very interesting from a space perspective. Uh, the, the difficult part isn't really the site, it's the launcher um, and getting a, 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 a launcher company engaged and launching from that site. That's, you know, you've kind of got the airport, but you need the airlines. Um, <laughs> yes. That's, uh, yeah, that, well, that's something we covered in our previous. We, we kind of covered on, off on that a bit in our previous episode, episode four, uh, and uh, Malcolm Davis made comment that th there's a regulatory environment at the moment that needs to be opened up in Australia as well. That's potentially delaying uh, this. Andy, did I hear you there? Welcome to come in. Oh, yes, I, I agree with Andy. I think that um, the capability maturity of uh, the Australian launch industry is not there yet. Um, and I think 2024 is probably going to be uh, too soon, but it'll happen. And the regulatory environment is tough, but there is a good reason for it. Uh, and uh, but but yes, I think that um, that uh, we have aspirations in that area, and therefore eventually we will be able to enhance the launch capability. We've got very determined people, both at the uh, the southern launch as well as equatorial launch uh, colleagues that are working very hard. But at this stage, they're not there yet. No, that's yeah. my view anyway. That's my personal view. You know, the, I think I've been really impressed with everybody I've, I've, I've talked to there. And they are, uh, they are, as you say, really great guys. Um, you know, one of the other big holes that needs to be filled is obviously money. I mean, you know, launching is a very expensive business to build a launch company. 
is extremely right. expensive. You know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions before you're getting to the point of making making money. And it's a uh, it's a difficult difficult market. And there's obviously a uh, a sort of supply and demand type challenge as well that that uh, it isn't quite a build it and they will come situation. You you also need the money go to go into the customers of those launch vehicles, people like ourselves. You're you're looking at the entire chain. So you have satellite builders, you have if you like application or or, or data providers, people like ourselves, customers, and then obviously the the launch providers themselves. So there's a, there's a a lot of cash that needs to flow into the infrastructure to make the whole thing work. Um, I was going to mention, you mentioned the channel partners, like, so your general IT sector uses channel as its main sort of business model. Is that how you see the space going the same way you sell through the channel? Because again, it's, it's certainly our be, approach. Uh, yeah. it, it, it is certainly our approach, but it isn't universally people's approach. No, not, not at all. Okay. Um, and I think that is, I think that's probably reflective of, if you look at imagery, some of the guys have been fantastically successful, like Planet, um, who have got many satellites in space, taking photos of the Earth and, and doing great things. They've also developed their own channel capability, but they also work through channel partners as well. So, uh, and that was partly because they were really, you know, they're on the front of the bow wave. They were needing to, develop the marketplace as well as develop the, 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 the technology itself. So they've done a great job at, at really doing, helping with those sorts of things. I think on the back of that, we're really riding on those coattails because there is a whole market now built up around analyzing, de delivering imagery applications, whether it's for uh, agriculture or, or maritime or what have you. And we then can sell into that as an additional data layer. And I think that, that that's really helped us open things up. So we're in a, a, a fortunate position now where we're not having to create our own applications and marketplace as well as create the technology and work. So, so yeah, we're in a good place. It, it's an interesting, it's good to have that slide up right now, the value proposition. But last week we covered off on robotics and autonomous systems. The week before that, we covered off on drone technology too. And just when you're talking about satellites, it's almost like a, a drone in, in space. It's just going up to the next next few layers. Um, so I imagine, you know, what we're going to see from drones and robotics and those autonomous systems. Uh, you mentioned the channel, like how do, the, how do you meet the customer? Uh, I imagine the channel would be a key factor in that because um, you're obviously touching base with the IT systems as well. Yeah, I think in reality, if you talk to an end user, um, and I think there's something in the space sector we forget sometimes, is nobody cares where the data comes from. It, it's They yeah. couldn't care less whether you're in space or whether you're flying a, a, a drone or UAV or flying a high altitude plane or a medium altitude plane or whatever it is. They, they really don't care the source of the data. You know, that's and some with connectivity. They don't care how you get connected, but if I'm connected, then that's good. Nobody cares where you get your TV from. Do you get it from a, do you get it from the cable? It doesn't really make any difference. It's important to the satellite providers that they're selling TV through satellites, but the user, the person watching TV doesn't care. And I think that's, you have to really sort of consider that as a data user as well. It's convenient for us to be in space because we can fly over areas you can't fly over with a drone. And yeah. so we're complementary to the drone capability, but we don't replace it because obviously drones can cover things much more often because they're in a much smaller area. So it is, uh, it's thinking about the layering and the, and the, this sort of, I used the analogy of the jigsaw puzzle earlier, that we're all part of that puzzle to deliver an intelligent solution to the customer so they know what's going on. They have a, 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 a you know, whether it's maritime domain awareness or an intelligence piece that is, is capable of delivering a solution for that. Um, and yep. it's many different layers that add, add up to that. Yeah, maybe just talk us through this slide here, the value proposition. What yeah, I, think, I think it's just a wrap up in terms of all, all the other aspects of really where, how, what, how we're approaching things um, to, to be cost effective, to reduce cost time for the analysts. So they are looking at a much smaller area of the ocean rather than the entire ocean trying to find things and, and you know, using algorithms to find artifacts within um, uh, images on the, of the ocean, um, 
multiple customers, whether it's government or industrial customers, really working through the channel partners as I described, talk you through the roadmap. And obviously we're very keen and we work very closely with lots of other data sets. And it's important for us, you know, touching on your, your, your previous speaker there, um, in terms of partnering people is, is much better than trying to go out you know, alone. It's certainly very much part of our business culture that we partner with many different uh, other data sets to help build up this, this overall picture, whether it's the IR guys or the multispectral guys or, uh, or imagery, et cetera, you know, all, all those things come together to deliver a solution to the customer. On our own, none of us deliver a complete solution. And I think it's important that, you know, these, these different technology, different sensor suites work together to really deliver what the customer wants. Great. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Now it doesn't work. Is this the last slide by chance? I think, you know, I think it's probably the last slide, yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. Go, Roman. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, God bless you. If I have a very typical, uh, you know, techno-commercial question. Uh, if I have limited budget of investing $100, looking into the supply chain of satellite uh, companies, where do you think I should invest my money in? Should I invest in the R&D, design, launch vehicle, maintenance, testing of satellites, where do you think I should invest? Which is the best way to get my return on my investment? Or should I just buy the satellite and sell it? And no financial advice offered. Roman always goes down the money side. And visualizing a question, will there be a time in the near future where we'll be selling satellites in the stock markets? You can buy Cleo the space on the ASX. Yeah, you, I would spend your hundred dollars buying stock in the space. It's, uh, we're, we're, we're readily available. I haven't checked our share price today. But... Hundred doesn't mean hundred. Put hundred x. Um, just on that, maybe we're twenty eight Australian cents today. You know, it's, uh, we're a very very good value. I'd say. Um, the uh, to answer your question, I think this comes back to what I was saying earlier. I think the 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 industry is a lot like a, a kind of house of cards. You need to invest in all the pillars, I'm mixing my metaphors, all your pillars, you need to keep investing in across the board. Have to always invest in R&D, and I don't mean just industrial R&D, but the blue sky, big R, small d, university type stuff. Um, moving up into the supply chain aspect, you need to have developed uh, satellite providers, particularly in a small space, that are delivering reliable satellites. So they're not university projects, that can last maybe six months. There's satellites that can last five to 10 years, but they're small. Um, obviously then investing in the payloads for those, investing in the ground segment, which lots of big players have done, investing in the launch capability, investing in the application and getting those downstream companies, getting them to market. So the AI guys and the machine learning guys and all those guys that are pulling different data sets together and delivering smaller niche applications into market verticals. You need to invest in across it. So I would be splitting into 10 chunks, putting $10 in each. And I think that you've got a fighting chance of making a successful outcome. And we won't hold you to that, but uh, we'll see what Roman's money, a hundred bucks it turns out in a few years. But um, I because my association is also investing in certain uh, projects. Uh, and we have got investors in US and Japan and in India also who are willing to invest on case by case basis. So I'll get in touch with you. My second question was a little more technical. Given the fact that satellites are the art of the day and India is also working on it. So India is also given the thought of reducing the cost of satellite technology coming down. In terms of the electronic warfare payloads coming to the satellite, where do you see the future? Uh, you mentioned about the electronic warfare, SIGINT, electronic intelligence, what kind of load payload will be there? And what is the market? Um, it, it's a very, very defense-centric market, evidently. Yes. Um, and I think you have to be cognizant of not uh, commercial space, which we're in, can deliver a supplementary or complementary data set to a governmental asset, but it's not going to replace it. So, um, you know, there's always going to be a need for a multi-hundred million dollar, well, in the US they would call an exquisite asset that is delivering, uh, a, a, you know, an incredible capability. 
commercials. But, and it's been the same in imagery for many years and, and SAR for many years where, where countries have their own assets, but then they're still buying commercial data sets to complement and enhance those because we fill in the gaps with regards to what's going on. So I think you would need to be quite cognizant with regard overstepping that mark. And at a certain point, a government is going to say, no, this isn't a commercial capability we want to buy. This is a sovereign asset that we need to own. We will own the sovereign asset because it, this is important that we control the full data set here. Um, so you need to be complementary to that. And so I think there's a point where you would overstep and go into, no, this is not this is not something we'll buy commercially. This is something we have to own as a country. Uh, can I, I bring um? That's a careful line. Yeah. Can I bring out the other Andy? Uh, if you're still on the line, Andy, from that research perspective, how are you balancing? what uh, Andrew just mentioned, the the cross, particularly on the startups where their startup might be focused on a defence, potentially a defence capability rather than a commercial capability. And he might not be there. No, okay. But anyway, look, on that particular note, we've gone uh, over time um, as we normally do on these topics because they're so interesting. Um, there's no other questions from the audience. Um, just checking on uh, Professor Coronius, you still there? I'm just going to give a word of thanks, but thank you so much. Um, and Andrew Bow, you sound Australian. Are you Australian? In a way, <laughs> background? No, I'm. 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 I'm sort of Canadian-born British. Canadian British. Uh, it's. It's. It kind of. It, it turns into a bit of a weird accent. <laughs> I was I trying to place it. Yeah, yeah, but uh, so obviously, and being an Australian uh, listed company, I thought there might have been a connection. But um, we'll keep in we keep in touch. We get the Cleos Space um, ASX media releases, so we'll stay in touch with you. Uh, we did reach out to one of your partners here um, that you just signed a recent deal with. Um, so that's all on drastic news. Um, and Raman, just a, a closing comment. Uh, just to convey my thanks to you and to the panelists. Just to remind you that on 8th of October, we have the Indian Air Force Day. On behalf of Chris, my own team, and all over, we wish the Indian Air Force the best of the time, 8th October, remember. Uh, the motto is touch the sky with glory, but for Andy and team in space, I say touch the space with glory. Thank you so much. Very good. Uh, that's in two days, so enjoy that day, uh, Raman. I'm sure you'll be going. Um, so look, we've been joined by, let me um, bring up the other presentation, one second, that should be it. Um, we've been joined by, um, from Cleos Space in Luxembourg, Andrew Bauer, the Chief Executive Officer, uh, and from Adelaide, the SmartSat Co Cooperative Research Centre, uh, Professor Andy Caronia, CEO and Managing Director for SmartSat CRC. Fascinating um, episode. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it's early in the morning there for you, Andy, as well. Uh, so these two episodes, we'll put a link between our two space episodes, but um, probably the two best uh, in terms of the topic. So on that note, uh, I'm going to close it off. We don't have any other announcements. Next week, we're mostly likely to be covering off on robotics and potentially computational design uh, in urban environments is an area I wanted to cover. Um, so on that note, I'm going to close it off. These sessions are available on My Security TV, uh, and uh, with the series, we've got two episodes to go. Uh, so we'll see you here next Tuesday. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Bauer, thank you so much for your time. Fascinating, and we'll stay in touch. We'd love to have you on again. Uh, thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. See you, Ramon. See you next week.